Well, good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure and privilege to bring to you tonight God's rescue plan. The greatest news I could possibly bring you because it is the greatest news there ever was and that there ever could be. So I'm privileged and I'm humbled to bring this to you tonight. I want to look at uh, two questions tonight because we are gathered here to remember the hardest part of God's rescue plan. The part where Jesus had to die, where he died for you and me, for all of our sins, for everyone who would ever believe he died for us. So here's the two questions, okay? Number one, why did Jesus die? And second of all, second question, who is this God? Who would die for me? Who would die for us? Who is he? Because, man, if he died for me, if he paid the penalty I'm supposed to pay, man, I better get to know him. So uh, we need some context to answer these questions. So we're going all the way to the beginning. Genesis 1.1. I know it's dark, so I'll probably be the only one reading. Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was nothing before creation except for God himself, right? Before time existed, there was just God. God and God alone existing in his Trinitarian form, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, living in and existing in perfect fellowship, perfect harmony, perfect communion, perfectly loving, and perfectly loved. God and God alone. And God wasn't lonely. He had the perfect relationship in the, within the Trinity. God wasn't bored. He didn't need something to do. God didn't need to create so that someone could worship him. God didn't need any of that. But we read, in the beginning, God created. Why? Why would a God, perfect, not in need of anything, why would he create? There's only one possible answer to this question when we read the Bible, and that is this. And don't let this pass you by. God wanted to share himself with someone else. God is so great, he's so wonderful, he's so awesome, awesome, he's so glorious. They said, I don't want to keep this to myself. I want someone else to enjoy me as well. So God creates so that he can bless. He creates so that someone else can enjoy him as well. Isn't that awesome? Wow, God, from the very beginning, from the very beginning, He's a gracious God. In the beginning, God created. And it's crazy. He creates everything, right? From the largest galaxies, stars, planets, the universe, all the way down to the small things, the individual blades of grass. God simply just speaks and galaxies are flung into existence. He simply speaks and the dry ground separates from the waters. He simply speaks, trees are formed. He simply speaks, the mountains are formed. The animals, the vegetation, everything. And it is all for what he's going to create on the last day of creation. On day six, Genesis 1, verse 26, we read, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our own image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. So get this, God makes everything and it's beautiful, it's perfect, it's wonderful. Every bit of creation exemplifies God's glory, his honor. And then he makes man, Adam and Eve. 
and he creates them in his own image, okay, which is, can, can be kind of a confusing thing. It doesn't mean that Adam and Eve looked like God. The number one thing it means is that Adam and Eve carried a similar function and responsibility as God. Okay, God is a ruler. He's a creator and a ruler, right? And he creates Adam and Eve, and twice in the passage I just read, he says, rule over creation. Everything I've created, you guys rule it, subdue it. So get this, he creates Adam and Eve, and right away he says, you two, you guys are the king and queen of everything. Now let me ask you this question, what did Adam and Eve do to deserve that honor? Nothing. Nothing. Grace upon grace, blessing upon blessing. Adam and Eve are basically babies. They were just created and God says, rule it all. This is for you. Wow. What kind of a God is that? That's a gracious God, an infinitely gracious God. Not only is he powerful enough to create, but he is gracious as well. As we move into chapter 2 in Genesis, we find out another trait of God. Verse 15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will certainly die. So this is one of those traits of God that's more tricky to talk about. It's not one that we like to talk about, right? The idea that God punishes sin. So God gives us this prohibition. He says, you can eat from any tree in the garden. I've given you all the trees, more than you could ever want. But this one tree, trust me, trust me, it's not good for you to eat. When you eat it, you will die. God's not a spoil sport. Don't you think God has already done enough to earn their trust? All God wants for Adam and Eve, all he wants from us is to trust him. He's our creator. He's our sustainer. Blessing upon blessing. Grace upon grace. He's showered upon them. All he wants them to do is to trust him. And when God says that they will surely die, he's not just talking about physical death. He's talking about spiritual death as well. Complete and utter separation from himself. And I know sometimes we look at this and it can seem harsh. Just one little sin, why? Why would it be so harsh? Well, here's the aspect of God that's sometimes hard for us to swallow. God is infinitely just as well. For every blessing, there is an equal and opposite curse. If to trust God means eternal life with him, then to distrust God must mean eternal separation apart from God. It's only fair. It's only just. I know it's hard to swallow, but if a murderer was to walk into a courtroom to be sentenced and the judge looked at him and said, I know what you've done. You've killed many people, but you know what? You don't have to go to jail. You don't have to pay a fine. Go home. You're free. That would be an awful judge, would it not? No one would call that justice. No one would like that judge. That judge would be fired. He'd never be asked back to be a judge again. Justice is part of perfection. And God is an infinitely just God. So he gives them this prohibition that many of us are familiar with Genesis 3, the fall of man, where Satan comes in the form of a serpent. And he tempts Eve and Adam. And he gets them to doubt God's goodness. And think about that. God had just created them, showered them with blessings. And then Satan comes in, and they immediately listen to his voice over God's. And they eat from the one tree they're not supposed to eat from. The first sin. Suddenly, Adam and Eve are aware of their shame. They're aware of their sin. They realize that they're naked. And God comes looking for them. And it's incredible. God finds them 
and he asked them what happened. Man, this is Adam's response. The man said, the woman who you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Did you catch that? (laughs) Adam not only blames the woman, he blames God himself. He says, the woman you gave to me. You know what? If I was God, in all seriousness, if this is Adam right here, this is what I would have (laughs) done. See ya. You're done. But that's not what God did. You know what God does? God clothes them. He covers their shame. God kicks them out of the garden, not to be mean, but because he knew it would be better for them out of the garden than in the garden. And now because of what Adam and Eve did, they bring a curse upon the world and upon themselves. But in the middle of these curses, God is speaking to the serpent. He's speaking to Satan. And he says this. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now, I know that's a bit cryptic, but what God is saying is this. Satan, you've messed some things up. You've introduced sin into the world. Adam and Eve, they're separated from me. But someone is going to come from me. Someone is going to come from this woman and saying, you're going to hurt him, but he's going to destroy you. Get this. Right after, right on the heels of their sin, of their doubting God, distrusting him, he already has a rescue plan. kind of a God is that? And here's the other cool part. God's infinitely just, right? He must punish sin. That's the only right, fair thing. But he extends mercy to Adam and Eve. He says there's a plan. He closed them. God is also infinitely mercy. And here comes the great mystery. How in the world can God be infinitely just? yet infinitely merciful. How can God punish sin, yet extend grace and mercy to the sinner? Throughout the rest of history, especially the rest of the Old Testament, it doesn't look very good for mankind. Every single person born is born a sinner, separated from God. And it doesn't take long. We get one generation away from Adam and Eve, Two of their sons, Cain and Abel, and Cain murders his brother over jealousy. We got a problem. A few generations after that, the world is full of people, and it's corrupt, wicked, full of violence, murder, all sorts of bad stuff. And the Bible says there's one righteous person on earth, and that's Noah and his family. And so God, we see the infinite justice of God as he wipes out the entire earth in a great flood, but spares Noah. And his family, and we think, oh, great, here's Noah. Maybe he's this person that's going to come from Eve and defeat sin and death. But right on the heels of him coming out of the ark, Noah gets drunk and ends up cursing one of his grandsons. So now check Noah off. He's not part of this great rescue plan, right? Moving on from there, we have the nation of Israel, this awesome nation that, that God raises up to be a light unto the world, to bring the world back to himself. But man, they are messed up. Time and time again, Israel runs away from God, serves other gods, makes false idols. They bow down to them. At one point in their history, they were sacrificing their children on altars to other gods. Man, Israel is not part of this rescue plan either. The Old Testament is full of sinful people, and we too here are in that same line of sinful people. Man, we have a problem. We are wretched. We are sinners. Sin is our number one problem. It is not world hunger. It is not fighting for world peace. Our number one problem is sin. At 
in the middle of this, man, in the middle of this, at the beginning of the climax of God's rescue plan, he comes down in the form of a baby. Man, don't let that pass you by. The same God who just spoke and galaxies flung into existence, the same God who just spoke and the dry ground was separated from the water, that God came down in the form of a baby. And when I hold my kids, especially Ada right now, who's only six months old, and I look down at her, I cannot help but imagine the Lord of the universe looking up at his parents, completely humbled, completely dependent on his parents. What kind of a God would do that? And Jesus grows up. Jesus, whose God become flesh, grows up. And Hebrews says he was tempted every way, in every way, just like us. Yet, he was without sin. Man, lived a perfect life. The only one who didn't deserve death. The wages of sin is death. But Jesus was perfect. He didn't deserve death. So he lives a perfect life. And when he's about 30 years old, he starts his public ministry. And he starts preaching about sin. And he starts telling people, you know what? You might think the Romans are your number one problem. Sin is your number one problem. People didn't like that too much. And then he goes on and takes it further. He says, and you know what? You can't overcome your own sin. you got to look to God. God is the only one who can save you from your sin. And he took it a little bit further, and he started saying that he was God, and that he himself was the only way that they could overcome their sin. And man, this really ticked people off, and they really didn't like that. So about 2,000 years ago, mankind decides to kill the creator of the universe. And not just kill him, Jesus was tortured. Jesus was whipped and beaten until the Bible says he was not even recognizable as a human. I don't know how many of you have seen The Passion of the Christ, but even as gory and as hard to watch as that is, it still doesn't convey what Jesus went through. And then he walks the road up to the mountain where he's crucified and he gets nailed to that cross and he's hanging there and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he knows why he's forsaken him. But in that moment, catch this, catch this. God is pouring out all the wrath upon all the sin of everyone who would ever believe on Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't just pay the penalty for your sin or for my sin. He paid it for everyone who would ever believe. That is a lot, a lot of wrath. And not only that, but remember, Jesus Christ is God the Son. He existed in eternity past with God, God alone in perfect relationship, in perfect harmony, in perfect communion with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And suddenly, that relationship, that relationship that we can't even comprehend how wonderful it was, was broken. What kind of a God is that? Why would he do that? Why would he die there. He paid the penalty. He died the death that we're supposed to die. The Lord of the universe. What kind of a God is that? That is an awesome, awesome God. And here is where the mystery of God's infinite justice and infinite mercy gets solved. Because in the death of Jesus Christ, 
sin gets punished. And in the death of Jesus Christ, God extends mercy to the sinner. And I know that this may be difficult to understand because why is it just for an innocent person to die and a sinner to be set free? How does that make any sense? Isn't that more unjust? Well, this is the way that I like to think about it. Imagine that you're in someone's house and you knock over a vase that's on a pedestal and you break it. The owner of the house is the only person that can say, I forgive you, don't worry about it, right? No one else can say, I forgive you. Only the owner of that vase or the owner of that house. And then to replace it, the owner will go out and out of his own money, he will replace the vase. Now just imagine that that vase is worth an infinite amount of money and you're the vase and you get broken. And there's no possible way that we could ever pay that price. And God says, you know what? I want that back. I'm going to pay for it out of my own money. Except it's not money that he's paying for. It's his own life. And there's nothing unjust about that. That is called infinite mercy. That is is the God who died on the cross for our sins. That is a wonderful, awesome, incredible rescue plan. It is incredible. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for my sin. I don't deserve it. We don't deserve it. Father, thank you for allowing your son to die in my place. I cannot fully comprehend why you would do that. I just rest in the fact that you love us. That you love us so much. That you were willing to die for us, to suffer for us, to be separated from yourself. God, thank you. Thank you for saving me. And God, thank you for paying the price to bring me back to yourself. Thank you for paying the price that I could never pay. And thank you for paying it for all of us. For all who would believe and reach out and believe in you and to trust you to do the one thing you created us to do, to trust you so that we can enjoy you and enjoy your blessings. Wow. So who is this God? Why did he die? Because he loves us. He loves us so much. Think about that. He loves us so much that he would die for us, that he would be tortured for us, that he would be separated from his father for us. Who is this God? Well, I can tell you a few things. He is an infinitely loving God. He is an infinitely gracious God. He's an infinitely merciful God and an infinitely just God. And he is way more awesome and incredible and wonderful than we could ever imagine. And I pray every day that I can get to know him more and more. Because that is the greatest rescue plan that is the greatest love story that we could possibly tell and that could possibly ever take place. Can I get an amen? Amen. In just a few moments, in a few minutes, we're going to celebrate communion. And this is when we just remember, we simply remember the Lord's death and what he did for us. And as we remember We should have hearts of gratitude and thankfulness for what he did for us. And this is what I want to challenge. For all of us who know Christ personally and have trusted in his death, just remember and be thankful for what he did. But for any of us here who might not know Jesus, who might not know God, who have never entered into a personal relationship with him, this is what I want you to do. This is what I challenge you to do. 
during communion, during the prayer time that we're going to have at any moment, come and find one of us pastors. Pastor Peter is here. Pastor Austin is here. I'm here. Come and find one of us. We want to talk to you. It is very simple to enter into a relationship with our Savior. And it's awesome. There is no life apart from God the Creator, God our Savior. And if you're here tonight and if you are feeling guilty, if you are feeling sinful, wretched, not enough, well, that's exactly where you need to be. God did not die for the perfect because there are no perfect people. He died for those who need him. So if you recognize your sin tonight, that is the best place to be. Come and find one of us. Please talk to us. We would love to help you enter into a wonderful relationship with God our Savior.